welcome to day seven of our DSA bootcamp. Now just two days are left for our bootcamp, and today and tomorrow we shall be studying about tree traversal, uh, basic sorts, and then merge and quick sort. And for these two days, we are actually not going to study about data structures, but algorithms. Can somebody just quickly unmute their mic or send me a chat explaining what is an algorithm? We all know what is data structures. We have been studying about them for six days now. We've studied about linked lists, stacks, queues, hash tables, trees, graphs, and heaps. And now we're going to study about algorithms. Does anybody remember the explanation I gave for algorithms on our day one, the cricket analogy? Okay, Darshan says steps followed. Just everybody, I would like an answer. What is an algorithm? N number of specified steps that we follow to solve a particular particular type of problem. Okay. Everybody else? Have you like answers from more people? On day one, I, uh, I compared DSA to cricket. If anybody remembers what was the analogy, you can tell from that as well. So if we recall uh, our day one, there I compared DSA to cricket. And I said that data structures are like different cricket equipment or like different cricket players. Uh, no, that is uh, data structures, Tanmay. Different equipment are like data structures and data structures can also be compared to molds or framework in which we uh, basically arrange our data. And algorithms are nothing but a way to manipulate these data structures to um, uh, reach a goal, to find the optimal solution. So as I said, that in uh, we live in an ever-changing world where we want uh, the best output in a short span of time with high efficiency, which is the reason why we study about time and space complexity. And this is the reason why we use time complexity to compare different codes and find out which code is the best for our specific application. And we have different data structures for different applications. So algorithm is nothing but a way to manipulate these data structures and find out the optimal solution. So as I said, our social networking sites such as LinkedIn and Instagram use a graph traversal algorithm to uh, explore your network. So basically each person that you follow is considered a node and you're connected to each other by uh, edges. And so uh, your social media uh, apps will be carrying out these tree traversal algorithms on it to uh, recommend you uh, different uh, accounts based on the specific network that you follow. And Instagram also lets you know who are your mutuals with a specific friend. Okay, so uh, tree traversal um, has two different uh, algorithms. One is the breadth first search and the depth first search. So uh, these are algorithms that you shall also be studying about in AI. No problem. Um, so uh, as a tree follows a hierarchical structure, in breadth first search, you shall simply start to iterate uh, through uh, the nodes of your tree level by level. And in depth first search, you shall be diving deep into the depth of the tree and then uh, backtrack and uh, return nodes one by one. So breadth first search is uh, pretty straightforward, but to carry out depth first search, there are three different methods. One is pre-order, one is post-order, and one is in order. And today's class will be quite lengthy, uh, and you'll have to pay a little more attention to the concept, but it's not difficult to understand. So let us have an introduction to tree traversal. Um, as you can see, um, if we want to uh, carry out iteration on a linked list, if you arrange all these elements in a linked list, the time complexity would be higher. So that's the reason why we arrange our nodes in trees. Everybody just try to keep your mic off. 
Okay, so in breadth first search, as you can see, we go through all the elements level by level. So first you shall return 47, then you shall return 21 and 76, then you shall return 18, 18 27, 52, 82 in this specific order. You shall see how it looks in the code soon. And then uh, we can talk about depth first search, where instead of uh, first returning 47, you will return 18, then you will return 21, and then 27. As I said, you backtrack in a depth first search algorithm, and then you uh, keep backtracking, and then you return rest of the nodes. This is essentially depth first search. Now we shall be studying um, a little more about breadth first search. As I said, in breadth first search, uh, if you guys recall our stacks and queues class, I said that we shall be implementing breadth first search using queues. So I'll just give an introduction to it. And after you uh, see how this um, algorithm works, I want to ask you how shall we be using queue to implement our breadth first search? So as you can see here, uh, we shall have a queue. Uh, queue list, and then we shall be having a results list. So at the end of your uh, breadth first search function, you shall be returning this results list that shall have carried out the breadth, breadth first search algorithm on your tree. And uh, for uh, implementing breadth first search, we shall be using queue. Can somebody give an idea of how we can do this? Does anybody have an idea? Let me just tell again what we are going to do. First, we shall be returning 47 then 21, then 76, then 18, 27, 52, 82. So notice what's happening here. First, we return 47. Then we return its left child and then right child. Then we uh, look at 21 and then we return its left child and right child. Then we take our 76 node and return its left and right child. So how can we uh, implement this? The message starts from a central value and then Traverse on both sides using previous and next. Uh, that's a good idea, but I would like to point out one thing. Um, previously, we implemented our queue data structure using linked list, but in this example, we are going to use a regular list. Carry out uh, our queue data structure. Any other suggestions? Okay, let us continue. So, um, as you can see, we shall first be appending 47 into the queue, and then we shall be popping this value. And uh, this is the reason why we said that we are using our queue data structure, we, because we shall be implementing this using the first in first out principle. So the first element shall be popped out and then we shall take its children, left child 21, right child 76, we'll append it into our queue and then we shall be popping 21. And then we can take its children and append it into the list 18 and 27 into our queue data structure. Then we pop 76, take its children, append it into queue and then we start popping it. And uh, 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 after we pop our uh, Use first element. We shall also be checking if there are any children. And if there are no children, we we'll simply continue to carry out our pop operation on our queue. As you can see, this is our results list. You can see that 47, then 21, 76, like this, they have all been arranged level by level. If you rearrange this, simply you can uh, reconstruct your thing like this. Now let's take a look at how we shall be implementing the code for this. So we shall be defining our function, our VFS. It shall not be taking in any parameter other than just the self. And then we shall be declaring a current node a variable. It shall be firstly equal to the self dot root. And then we will be, uh, first of all, initializing a queue and a results empty list. And we shall be appending current node into the uh, queue, first of all. And then we shall be running a while loop 
that carries out the operation of finding of the children and then appending into our results list. Just a minute. Okay. Let us continue. So uh, as I said, we shall be having uh, initialized our queue and results empty list. And then first of all, we shall append this current node, our root, into our queue. And then after that, we shall be running our while loop. We shall be running on this condition. And it's a very interesting condition. While length of the queue is greater than zero. And this is the reason why we first decided to append this 47 into our queue list so that we can start running this while loop. Otherwise, if we simply uh, just initialized our queue uh, list and then we started running this code, it wouldn't work. And this condition is very essential for terminating our uh, function. Let's see how that works. So uh, one by one, you shall be popping out all the elements uh, from your queue. We shall be removing the first element. And then you shall be appending this value in the results list. As you can see here, current note that value will be appending to your results list. Now we shall be iterating through the left and the right chain. For that, you will have to check first of all if uh, there is a child existing or not. So this is our uh, if conditional. If current note dot left is not none, then we shall uh, first of all not add it to our results list, but to our queue. As you can see, queue dot append current node dot left. Then we shall be carrying out the same code line for the right child of your um, of the element that's um, at the first location in your list. And the current node will keep getting updated to the uh, element that's in the first location of your list at index equal to zero. So this is how this operation would continue to run and your list will continue to change. As you can see here, 18 and 27 were added into the queue, 76 was popped, and now current node has become equal to 76 because that's the uh, element that was at index zero. Now uh, we, we append it into our result list, then we check its children, and then we append those children into our queue list. And then um, we slowly, slowly continue the same operation. And then all the children have been added into our queue. And then they are added into our results list. And then uh, we shall simply return our results list. This was a pretty easy concept to understand. Uh, if you keep going through this again and again, you'll uh, get an idea about it and it'll be very easy to understand. Now let's run our custom input. So we carried out insert operation on our tree. We had already defined it in our previous classes for our binary search tree, as you can see here. And then after we carry out breadth first search on our cell, uh, on our tree, we shall have returned these, uh, this list. I hope it's clear. If uh, anybody has any doubts, you can unmute your mic or send a chat. Now we shall be talking about uh, depth for search. And as I said, we have to go through depth for search pre-order, post-order, and in-order different codes. So pre-order is basically um, parent, then left child, and then right child. So as it is depth for search, you shall be plunging deep into the depth of your tree. So you go to 47 node, then you look at its left child, 21, and then you look at the 21 nodes left child, which is 18. And then it shall be uh, returning these values like this. First 47, then 21, then 18, and then 27. Let's look at it again. First, we look at the left child, and we keep going towards the left child. Then we start returning the right sibling, and then uh, we'll be done with our left subtree. And then we shall be going to the right side. Uh, then we shall return again the left child and the right child. 76, then 52, and then 82. So first parent, then left child, and then right child. Now let's take a look at the code for this. We shall be uh, using stack to uh, visualize this code so that we can understand exactly how it's running. Now pre-order, post-order, and in-order have the same code lines, by the way. 
but um, as we uh, go to different code functions we shall simply rearrange the code lines that's all so for uh, depth first search we shall not be initializing any queue data structure we shall simply be initializing a results empty list and we shall be carrying out this traverse function on it now uh, it might look like an intimidating code but let's uh, break this down so our uh, traverse function shall be taking in this current node as its input parameter and essentially as i said pre order is parent then left child and then right child so first step will be to append this parent node into our results list and then it will check out its child now you can find out that there is a left child here so 21 if uh, this is the case if you have a left child then you shall be running this function on your left child traverse current load dot left so this is actually the concept of recursion if you recall here uh, this and uh, this function shall be repeated so what shall happen is this 21 will be appended into the results list again this code line will run for a 21 node and then we shall be looking at its child 18 um, I'm explaining it like this, uh, but when you see, see it in the call stack, you will uh, get an even better understanding of it. So we uh, appended uh, 21 into our results list. Now this code line is done running for our 21 node. So it shall be popped off from the stack. And um, then we shall be searching if there is a right shell to our 21 node, which is true. And then we shall be carrying out this traverse function on our 27 node which means we shall be appending into the, into the results list. And 18 and 27 didn't have any children, so now we're done. We are going to pop this off uh, from the stack. Even 21 shall be removed. Now we shall be returning to our 47 node. And uh, so for the 47 node, we are done going through this if conditional for the left child. Now we shall be going for the if conditional for the right child. So 47 has a right child. So what shall be happening is uh, we shall be uh, carrying out the traverse function on this right child over here, which means 76 shall get appended into the results list. And then uh, as the traverse function is running on it, for the 76 node as well, you shall be searching for a left child. And in this case, 76 does have a left child. So we shall be carrying out the traverse operation on it. And then 52 shall get appended to the results list. And 52 and uh, 52 shall be searching for a left or a right shell. And that's not uh, the case. So a uh, traverse function will stop running on our 52 and 52 shall be popped off from our stack. Now we are uh, done with 52. Now we shall be uh, again going to 76. And as our first if conditional is done running, we shall now be going to the second if conditional where we shall be searching for the right shell which is the 82 node here. And then again, the traverse function will run on 82 and 82 shall get appended into the results list. And as 82 doesn't have any children, it will be popped off from the call stack and then our code shall be finished. Now let's take a look at it with a visual. Now you'll see exactly what happens in the call stack and how this function runs step by step. So uh, this actually helps us understand the importance of stack as well. You'll understand this uh, so that the order doesn't get messed up. And by default, in our uh, BFS function, we shall uh, first of all uh, run this function by saying traverse self dot root. We shall be running traverse on our root. As you can see, 47 has now been added, uh, pushed into our call stack, and now it has been appended into the results list. Then we check for its children, and now 21 has been pushed into our call stack. Now we'll be appending it into the res results list. Then we shall be looking for its left child. And then uh, there is a child here. So we shall be pushing it onto the stack, adding it to the results list. We'll be checking uh, if it has any children. If it doesn't have any children. It's popped off from the call stack. Now we are done running the left uh, conditional for our 21 node. So now we have run our right conditional. We find out 27. We append it into the result list. We check for its children. There is no, there is no child. We pop it off from the stack, and now we're done with the 21, uh, uh, 21 node as well. Now we're back to 47. Now we're going to check for its right child, which is 76. It exists. We'll append it into the results list. We'll carry out this traverse function on it. 52 is its left child. Append it into the results list. 
and uh, 52 doesn't have any children, so it's popped off from the stack. 76 will not check for a right child. 82, it shall be appended into the list and it shall uh, check for its children. There are no children, it is popped off. 76 is also done, it is popped off. And the entire function has now been run for 47 for left and right child. So it shall also get popped off from the call stack. And this, uh, and now our function has terminated. And at the end, we shall be simply returning the results. Or something. Sorry? Can, okay. Can we just directly use while Q instead of while length? Uh, I think that might work. Um, you can try running the code. I think it might work. But I mean, uh, I think there is supposed to be a conditional for the Q, right? Like if you say while Q, uh, we have not initialized Q to be equal to a Boolean value, right? See, this while uh, loop runs for a Boolean value, for true or for false. If you say while Q, it wouldn't be returning true or false. But if length Q greater than zero, as you can see, this is a comparison. So it should return true or false. But that wouldn't be the case if we say while Q. Maybe it won't work. Because we have not initialized Q to be equal to true or false. We have initialized Q to be equal to an empty list. Is that clear, Mihi? If it's true, okay. Any doubts until here? Let us run our custom input. As you can see here, uh, this is essentially what our depth per search pre-order function shall be returning. As you can see here, 47, then 21, then you find its left child 18, then 21's right child 27, then 47's right child 76, then 76 left child 52, and 76 uh, right child 82. After we run this, we will essentially just get this new list which I'll have carried out this pre-order traversal on our binary search tree. Now, rest, if this code is understood, rest all of the codes can be understood. Uh, so now we shall be looking into the post-order tree traversal method. Now in post-order, uh, we shall first of all be returning the left child, then the right child, and then the parent. As you can see here, 18 has been returned first, then it's sibling 27, and then it's parent 21. Now we're done with the left side. Now we shall be looking at our parent 47. We shall be uh, adding it to our results list. Now we're done with the left side. Now we shall be looking. Oh no, uh, yeah, uh, parent will be the last one. So we shall not be returning 47 so soon. We shall add it at the last. Now we shall be going into the right side of our list and we shall return 52 then 82, then 76, and then 47. So in uh, post order, first the left child, the right child, and the parent at the end. So in any post order operation, the root element shall be returned uh, at the last index of your list, your results list. Okay, let us continue. Now we are going to write our code for our post order. And it's essentially the same. Everything is the same. Results is equal to an empty list. And then we shall be defining this traverse function. All the code lines will be the same. Just we are going to rearrange the code lines. Here, as you can see, this is our pre-order function. Now we shall simply take this results.append method, this code line, and then we'll simply add it to the end. Now what shall happen is, Instead of firstly just uh, returning this parent, we shall first look uh, deeper and deeper for the left child. And then we shall be returning the left child. Then we'll go to the right child, and then we'll go to the parent. As you can see here, 47 has been pushed onto the call stack after we call our uh, traverse function on our root, which is 47 node here. Then we shall be um, checking for our left child, and left child is there, so we shall be carrying out this traverse function on our left child. So what will happen is it shall be checking for the left child, and then uh, since it exists for our 21 node, uh, we shall be now pushing on that left child onto our call stack. 
and then uh, we'll be checking if 18 has any children and since 18 doesn't have any children both of these if conditionals will not be run and we'll simply append 18 to our results list as you can see here 18 shall be added to the list now 18 doesn't have any children it shall be popped off from this tab now we shall be uh, now we have uh, 21 at the top of our stack so uh, we shall be carrying out this traverse function on the right child. So when we reach the right child of our 21 node, we shall be checking if it has any children. It, uh, there is no case like that. So we shall append this into our results list. Left child, then right child, and then our parents. Now 21 has uh, is done running this um, if conditionals for the left and right child. So we shall append it into our results list. Now 47 is not done yet. 47 has uh, is done looking for the left child. Now we shall be moving towards the right child. Now we take a look at our 76 node here. We check for left child and uh, we see that it doesn't have any children. We append it into our list. Then we check for 76 is right child, which is 82. It doesn't have any children. It gets appended into the results list. And now 76 is done running both of these if conditionals. Now we will be appending it into the results list. And now 47 is done running uh, the left and right uh, child conditional. So it shall be appended, so, uh, this value shall be getting appended into our results list. And now our function is finished running and we shall be returning the results list. As you can see here, this is our code. This is how it ran, was running. Now we shall be running the custom input. As you can see, after we carry out our depth first search operation uh, in pre-order form on our tree as you can see first of all the least value has been added uh, the leftmost value has been added by the way this is not a simple binary tree this is a binary search tree all these operations are done on a binary search tree so we shall be adding 18 then it's right child 27 then 21 it's parent node then 76 uh, first, then 52, then 82, and then 76, and then 47. Just keep in mind that uh, post order means left child, then right child, and then parent. So after we run our code, our DFS post order function, we shall have carried out uh, this traversal on our tree. As you can see here. Now we shall be studying about in order. So in order is basically um, first you return 18, which is the left child. Then you return its parent, which is the 21 node here. And then you shall be returning 27. As you can see here, uh, it's basically in order. You can see the values keep increasing. First 18, which is the left child, leftmost child, then the parent node 21, and then the right child 27. Then you shall be returning 47. And then we will be going to this uh, right child. Then you shall be returning its left child, then the parent, and then the right child. This is our in order function. Now we shall be studying code for it. Again, um, everything will be the same. We shall simply be arranging the code lines in our traverse function. We have initialized our empty results list, our traverse function, our current node parameter. And now, uh, as we remember, for post order, we had added this results code line at the last, but for in order, we shall be adding it in between. So let us look at the call stack visual and we shall understand how exactly will this function run on this example. As you can see, first 47 will be pop, uh, pushed into our stack. Now we shall be checking its left child, which is 21. And then we shall be carrying out the operation on 21. And um, we shall be checking for 21's left child, which is 18. 18 doesn't have any children, so it shall be getting appended into the results list. Now we shall be uh, popping 18 off from the stack. And now we are going to run this um, uh, results condition which is adding the uh, 21 into our results list and after that we shall be checking for its right child which is 27 then we'll carry out the traverse function on it no children for 27 added into the results list 
and then we will pop it off. Now 21 shall also get popped off. And then we shall be uh, uh, getting back to 47. And we are done with uh, running this first if conditional. Now we shall be simply appending 47 into the list. And then we shall be uh, checking for its right shell. As you can see, 76 is the right shell. 76 is left shell is 52. It doesn't have any children. It gets appended into the list and popped off from the stack. Then 76 is right child list check, which is 82. 82 doesn't have any children. Uh, it gets popped into the results list. And then, um, as you can see here, this code has been done running. It uh, afterwards there are no children left, so it simply gets popped off. Uh, was it too fast? Did everybody understand it? If somebody didn't understand, just raise your hand. I'll return it. Up. Uh, I'll re-explain it. Now we shall be running our custom input. As you can see, this is our code. This is our binary search tree. And as you can see, uh, it's really interesting. In, in order, all of the elements are in increasing order. And uh, the first element is like the least value. The last element is like the last value. You can use these um, outputs to you know, cross check your code. So you'll understand if your code is actually working properly or not, if your uh, conditions are satisfied. So this was it for lead reversal. If anybody has any doubts until here, you can unmute yourself or you can send a chat. Okay, I think there are no doubts. Now we shall be getting into our basic sorting techniques. So basic sorts, uh, we shall be studying about bubble sort, selection sort, and insert sort. Now, um, these are actually sorting methods that are only used for educational purposes. They don't really have any wide scale applications. So um, this is the reason why I think it's called a basic sort. They don't really have any wide scale applications. And um, the code for them is a little tricky to understand. Just pay careful attention to it and you'll get an idea. Firstly, we shall be looking into our bubble sort. So in bubble sort, we simply bubble up the highest value uh, into at the end of our list. Then we'll be bubbling up the second highest value at the second last uh, end of our list. You may be hot water and get out when it. Okay, let us continue. So this was our bubble sort technique where we just uh, bubble up all the elements um, from the highest, uh, from the lowest to the highest. We shall see how it works. So this is our unsorted list and we shall be carrying out the bubble sort operation on it. So we shall be starting from the index uh, at uh, uh, from index zero. And we shall essentially start comparing it and we We'll continue to swap it um, according to our need. For example, if this four uh, is greater than two, so we shall be swapping those two values. As you can see, it's swapped. Then we can see four and six. Four is less than six, so we shall not be carrying out any swap on it. And uh, then uh, we shall have we shall stop uh, going through this four uh, value here. We shall first of all let's take a look one more time. Four and six do not get swapped. Then six and five will be getting sorted. Then six and one will get swapped and three and six. So we shall be uh, essentially incrementing the index, which uh, shall be carrying out uh, a comparison with the value at the next index. And based on that, we shall be, uh, we'll be comparing them. And if the value at the, uh, at one less index, is greater than the next index, then we shall be swapping those two elements. And this helps us to bubble up our highest value at the end of our list. And again, we'll start. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that um, in our first iteration, we carried out five swaps actually. One, two, three, four, and five, which was coincidentally one less than the length of our list. And we shall be using this concept while writing down our code as well. 
So as you uh, keep running through uh, one by one the entire iteration, as you keep iterating through the entire list, uh, by the end, uh, the number of swaps that occur will keep decreasing one by one. Okay, let's continue. So we have sorted six at the end of our list. It has been bubbled up. Again, we shall be carrying out this operation. Two and four get compared. Four and five get compared. Five and one was compared. And then five and three were compared. And then five got bubbled up to the second last position. Then we shall again compare two with four and uh, four with one. As you can see, they'll get swapped. Four and three will get swapped. Then two and one will get swapped. Two and three will get compared. Uh, there's no need to sort them. Two and one will also get compared. No need to sort them. Now we have bubbled up our entire uh, list. So this was our bubble sort method. Now let's take a look at the code for it. So as I said, um, the amount of operations, that, uh, uh, amount of swaps that will be happening will be one less than the length of your list. So we shall be initializing a for loop for that. Which you can see here. Um, everybody remembers, right? How this uh, specific kind of uh, range function goes on. You start from the last value, and then you're going to reach the first value, and you shall decrement it by one. So, um, if you want, I can. Um, after I'm done teaching about this bubble sort code, I will show exactly how these steps uh, will keep changing as um, our for loop keeps running. I'll show afterwards. So at first, our uh, function shall run five times, then it will run four times, then three times, then two times, then one time, like that. So in order to keep track of the number of steps, we have our J for loop, which shall be running I number of times. So as I said, first it will run five times, then four, three, two, one, like that. It will keep decreasing. As you can see, uh, and then, uh, we shall be carrying out a comparison between um, index at a specific location and then index and the value at right the next location. And uh, we shall be having our if conditional for that. And if this if conditional is satisfied, which says that if index at location J is greater than index uh, value of uh, index J plus one, then we shall be carrying out our swap operation on it. Simple. As you can see here. Now, does anybody notice something interesting about this swap operation? We have declared our temp variable and all of that. Does somebody see something interesting about the way we have uh, declared our uh, exchange operation or swap operation here? You can unmute yourself or send a chat. Again, this takes us back to the concept we learned on day one, which is the concept of pointers. Does anybody have any idea? Okay, uh, can we write this code in a different way as well? If there is a way, exactly, exactly, correct, then my. Since this is a list and list is an immutable data type, you can you don't need to declare a temp variable for this. I have tried running the code without this temp variable and simply by writing what Tanmay has written and the code runs successfully as well. You can write it down this way as well. As you can see, um, uh, I don't think there is a need to go in depth. As you know that if the element at J is greater than the element at J plus one, we shall be simply exchanging their values. Minus J will be equal to minus J plus one and minus J plus one will be to minus j and then um, by the end uh, we shall have run out these operations um, for all these specific amount of times and then uh, we shall have updated our list and then we shall be returning our list as you can see here this is our bubble sort code this is our unsorted list after we run bubble sort on it we have the sorted list now um, I would like to go to the PyCharm console and uh, just 
give a quick brief of how this uh, how these steps work so i have copied down our bubble sort code here and um, here um, i have decided to print j which is the step, number of steps that shall be carried out as you can see here for each for loop you can see first we print out values from 0 to 4 which means five iterations and as you can see the length of our list is equal to 6 so first it runs five times then next operation you can see it has run from 0 to 3 which means it has run four times then it runs from 0 to 2 three times then it runs from 0 to 1 which is two times and then it runs uh, uh, 0 which means it runs one time this is just the number that is um, outputted, but uh, this essentially uh, tells you the amount of steps that are carried out. I hope that cleared up the concept even more. Now let us continue. Yeah, now we are going to look at selection sort. Now in bubble sort, we were not really keeping track of any index here, but for selection sort, we shall be keeping, uh, we will be declaring a minimum index, and then uh, we shall simply assume that the uh, value at index zero is our minimum index. And then we shall be comparing it to the rest of the elements, and then we shall keep on updating the minimum index according to uh, the kinds of values that we find. And then by the end of our for loop, we shall have found out our minimum index. So in our case, first we initialize minimum index to be equal to zero. Four is located at this index. Now, um, when we uh, run our code, uh, first of all, uh, we shall be uh, comparing four with two. So minimum index will get updated to one. Now then two will be getting compared to six. And six is greater, so we won't make any changes. Five is greater, we won't make any changes. Now one is less than two. So minimum index will get updated to uh, zero, one, two, three, four. As you can see, minimum index will become four. And then one, uh, three, uh, one and three will get compared and three is greater than one. So minimum index won't get updated. So after that, we shall have updated our minimum index. And then we shall simply exchange this minimum index with the index zero here, which, we, which is our four value here. And then uh, minimum index will uh, be, this entire function will run again. And our minimum index will be declared as equal to the next element, which means first we declare minimum index to be equal to zero. Then we'll declare it to be equal to one. For that, we shall be making use of our for loop. As you can see, 4 gets compared to 2. 4 will get compared to 2, and minimum index will get updated to be equal to 1 here. Then 2 will be getting compared to 6, and then 5, and then 1. Turns out 1 is lesser than 2, and minimum index will get updated. 3 is not greater than 1, so it shall not get updated, and 1 and 4 get exchanged. Now we shall be, uh, now we have sorted one. Now we shall be looking at this other minimum index, which shall be uh, one. Now we shall be carrying out the same operation on it. Um, and turns out in this special condition, uh, minimum index shall not be getting updated. Because turns out uh, in this uh, unsorted portion of our list here, this is in fact the minimum index. And for that also we shall be writing out our code. So our swap operation shall only run if our minimum index has been updated. So in this case, it has not, so it shall not be swapping it with any other value. Next, our minimum index will be the value at two. Now six will get compared to five, four, three. And um, as you can see, we shall continue to update. As you can see, now it's three become, now it's four and now it's five. Now three has become our new minimum index and it shall be getting exchanged with six. Now, one, two, three has been sorted. We shall be carrying out the same operation on five. Minimum index is at three. It gets uh, now this 
five value will get compared to four. And then uh, we find out that four is then five. So minimum index will get updated to be equal to four. And uh, we compare it with six. Uh, there's no difference. So minimum index was updated and we um, exchanged four with five. Now minimum index has become equal to four and we compare this um, value with the next value and uh, we don't have to update the minimum index. So uh, essentially uh, this was our code. I hope this is understandable. Just go through these concepts again and again and then you will remember this is mostly memory based. Now we shall be uh, declaring our selection sort function, which shall be taking in a list as its input parameter. So uh, our, as I said, we shall be declaring a for loop for implementing these for all these steps for our selection sort. It shall be running. Um, yeah, uh, one interesting thing to point out about this for loop is that it shall be running from zero to length minus one. So what shall be happening is our I for loop shall be running. For example, our list size is equal to six. So it shall be running from zero to five. But as you know, in our range function, the uh, the right side value, this last value shall not get considered. It shall always be minus one. So actually we shall be running from zero to four. So we'll be running from zero, one, two, three, four. This last element wouldn't be coming uh, into consideration and you'll see why. We shall definitely carry out this operation on our entire list. And for that, we shall be declaring another for loop. So um, we shall be declaring minimum index to be equal to i, which shall be starting from index equal to zero. And then we shall be declaring a j for loop, which shall start from write the next index, which will be index of i plus one until the length of our list. Let us see how the code looks. As you can see, we have declared another for loop, our j for loop, which shall run from i plus one to the ending of the length of our list. So um, as you can see, our i for loop shall run from zero to four, zero, one, two, three, four, until one, this one value here, until index four, it shall run. And then we have our j for loop, which shall start from index one, and it shall iterate until the uh, ending of our list. So now in this J for loop, we shall be carrying out a comparison between this minimum index and this uh, index J. As you can see, we shall be carrying out a comparison and according to that, we shall be updating the value. So you can see the difference here. In bubble sort, we simply carried out swaps endlessly, but in selection sort, we shall be endlessly updating the minimum index and at the end, we shall be simply swapping it with the previous minimum index. As you can see, this is initially minimum index equal to i, and then um, uh, j shall be running from i plus one. As you can see, j shall get compared to this minimum index. And if j, uh, if the uh, value at index j is in fact less than the value at index uh, minimum index, then we shall be declaring uh, our minimum index to be equal to j. I hope this is understandable until now. As you can see, minimum index has been updated through our continuous iterations. Now we have sorted our minimum index and for that we shall have to carry out this swap operation. Uh, um, as we spoke about this special case, this uh, at end, uh, this two value here. For this two value, uh, nothing would change actually. Minimum index will not get updated. And um, so there's no point in running any exchange operation for this. So that's why we shall be bringing in our if conditional statement. And this walk function will only run if that if conditional is satisfied, which is if i is not equal to minimum index, which means if our minimum index has in fact been updated, that's the only time when you shall be running this swap operation. As you can see here, 
And by the end of our function, we shall have updated our list and then we shall be returning our list. So here you can see we have our unsorted list. After we carry out selection sort on it, we have an updated list. Uh, we have our sorted list. If it is not clear, you can just raise your hand. I will repeat the concept. So this was selection sort. Now we shall be going into insertion sort. So in insertion sort, uh, again, you shall be simply taking in um, index one instead of index zero. So in selection sort, we declare our minimum index to be equal to zero, but in insertion sort, we shall be taking in the value at index one. And then, um, yeah, um, this concept of insertion sort mainly runs on this assumption that the index zero is sorted. This is how we declare our insertion sort method. We assume that the uh, value at index equal to zero is already sorted. And we shall be carrying out this insertion operation on the rest of the elements. We shall be comparing it to this um, element, and then we will be uh, swapping it along with it. As you can see, then we updated our index to be equal to six. Six was compared with four. It was greater, so no need to change anything. Five uh, was compared with six and then with four. And um, six, uh, five had to be changed uh, in arrangement with com uh, comparison to six, but no need to uh, rearrange with respect to four. So it shall be uh, inserted between four and six. Then we shall be carrying out the same for one and for three. As you can see, three shall get compared to six, then five, then four, and then two. And we find out that four is uh, greater than three, but two is not greater than three. So we shall uh, append it uh, in a location that is right before uh, our four value. Now, when we are running our code, uh, we are when we are declaring our code. This is the kind of list that we shall be finding out. Now let's declare our code for it. So as you can see, uh, we shall again be declaring a for loop for our insertion sort iterations. Um, so as you can see, we are going to start from index one rather than index zero. And now we shall be declaring a temp variable, uh, which shall continue to get updated. And now we have our J value here, which is the previous value with which we shall continue to compare our temp variable here. So J is going to be equal to I minus one and temp equal to the element at index I. As you can see, for example, here in our list, one and two have been sorted, five and six have been sorted. This four and three needs to be sorted. So um, for example, if our temp variable is this index, uh, is uh, this value three here. And um, so uh, automatically um, our J index will be equal to uh, the value at four, uh, the value at i minus one, which is four here. Now we shall be running this while loop, which shall be running until this condition is satisfied. And this condition says that this temp variable is less than the element at the index that is uh, right before our temp variables index. While temp less than my list j, as you can see here. Um, if that is the case, if our condition is getting satisfied, then what we shall do is we shall simply um, change the value uh, from j plus one to be equal to j. And then we shall be updating uh, this uh, element at this location to be equal to temp. And then j which, uh, will get uh, decremented by one. So uh, we shall be carrying out this operation only on three for our understanding. So what we did is declare three as our temp variable and four was our element uh, located at index J, which is one element, uh, which is one index less than the location our temp variable was in. So we shall uh, simply swap these two values. Um, we will uh, kind of create an empty uh, space for our temp variable here. And then um, since this is uh, playing with the locations of our uh, list, 
we shall say mildest j is equal to temp and then uh, our temp variable wouldn't exactly change it would still be this 3 and now um, we have uh, essentially just took our temp variable and shifted it one position to the left now our j variable uh, our j index with which we were carrying out this comparison will get decremented by 1 because our temp variable will also get decremented by 1 in terms of its location so again we shall be carrying out this comparison on the new updated index j and then we, can, we find out that uh, 3 is actually greater than 2 so we shall stop running this while loop now there would uh, be a special case here for example if 1 and 2 were unsorted and 1 was our temp variable and uh, index j uh, was this uh, the one holding this 2 value here so we shall compare 1 with 2 and then we shall be um, swapping these two and then we shall um, our by loop as usual we'll be updating this j to be uh, decreasing by 1 but in our case uh, j was already equal to 0 so if we carry out this code line then j will be equal to minus 1 and we don't want that so if that is happening then we want to terminate this while loop and for that we shall be having our additional condition that says j greater than minus 1 is this clear until now so as you can see these sorting techniques are a little more complicated and they are they might not seem as intuitive for these codes you'll have to uh, go through the concept again and again and then you'll finally understand what exactly is happening here in selection and insertion sort you shall be playing with indices and in double sort you shall continue to swap endlessly so we shall be running our insertion sort code here we have our unsorted list and then we carry out our um, operation on it and we have written our sorted list so this was it for today's session